is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering The High Lord by Trudy Canavan. Chapters 30, 31, and 32. Brought to you by Ashley. In these chapters, we are getting the lead up to a pretty smart plan that I didn't think there would be time for, but actually appears to be working out really well. I like this direction that we're going in, but I'm also a little bit we're worried about what's going on with Rothen. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Um, I am really, really into this part of the story. I didn't like, I, I have to admit that a lot of times in fiction where there's like a sort of, um, there's a big confrontation coming up. It's sort of funny to me that a lot of times that's what, what, readers are are here for right like they're they're waiting for this confrontation they're waiting for a moment of truth basically between two parties that are either equally powerful or uh wildly outmatched simply because they are dying to know how this can possibly work out i have always been somebody <laughs> it's kind of on brand if you know me I've always been somebody who suffers from pretty bad anxiety. And because of this, I have been someone who is, who kind of dreads those confrontations actually in stories. And, um, it's, it's not because like I ever really believe that my hero or the person that I want to come out the other side isn't going to win. It really comes down to more that I don't want I don't want to cope with the anxiety before they win. I don't, you know, there's always going to be like that moment where it looks like all is lost and our hero gets like gripped up by the bad guy and thrown around or tortured or whatever. And that's really just the pattern of how these kinds of stories tend to go is that there is a moment when it looks like they're going to lose and that moment is always drawn out in order to really like make it so that it seems like there's no hope left just before somebody swoops in and fixes everything and even though i know that it's before something swoops in deus ex machina another character that character's own powers even though i know that's coming the anxiety and pain of the moments before is often I find personally not really made up for adequately. Does that make sense? Like you, you read something that kind of um, tends to draw out the pain and then the retribution or the success or victory or whatever happens so suddenly and abruptly and, and is over so quickly that you don't feel like you got your money's worth on the other end of things, or, you know, you're still smarting from how brutal and cruel the villain was. And then the victor does this like merciful thing and you want them so much to like actually take revenge. And of course they're the, they're the protagonist a lot of times because they're more merciful because they are not the type to take out revenge and they restrain themselves and try and do better. But that leads a lot of the time to it not feeling satisfying in the end. All of this to say that a lifetime of reading and not entirely being satisfied the majority of the time 
that there is a wild face-off has led to me kind of being mistrustful in general of big face-offs and battles and things like that. Um, and there are definite exceptions, you know, there really are, and, and they're great, but they are the exception. And I know that by now. And I don't know whether that's because some writers are, are only thinking that what their readers want is simply for the protagonist to win if they think that's all we're after. But I personally want more than a win. I want a win and a promise that everything is going to be better. I want a win and an assurance that the person who started this fight isn't going to be coming back or like the people that followed them and supported them have learned their lesson and won't be giving them support again. There's, I want long term satisfaction and it's just, I don't know if it's just hard to write or if a lot of writers kind of want to leave room for a um, sequel or whatever. But yeah, so like, and, and I'll be honest, I felt that way with the first book in this series because Fergan just gets sent away. And to me, that's not adequate at all. This guy was going to try and he had somebody imprisoned that he was thinking he may have to kill. And he was just like going to do that. And he was going to try and do something to Sunia that would probably that could have resulted in her being executed. I do not think exile is adequate. And I think the fact that they took that they didn't take it seriously enough indicates that the the guild is not un, like either willing to punish the people that are of higher birth or that they are um, not fully appreciating the depth of what he was doing. Now, I, I say that I didn't find it satisfying, but at the same time, I feel like what they did was on character for the guild, which is, you know, they don't really have respect for lower classes and they, they, give too much slack to people who are of higher birth. So it's one of those balances where it's like, I don't, I wasn't satisfied, but I also recognize that like being unsatisfied by the way laws are enforced when you are someone of a lower class is the truth of the matter. And would it have been realistic for the writer to make it so that they, like did anything more than exile would they execute him would they remove him from the guild would he would they do any of those things no they wouldn't would i have really trusted her as a writer if she decided to punish him so drastically i don't know i think probably i would simply because my desire for real satisfaction there would have been more would have been enough to like carry me past what I knew wasn't really true, if that makes sense. So I don't I just struggle with this. So all of this to say that as we come closer to the end of this book, and I know that there's this inevitable showdown coming, that the Sachakins, that the um the Ichani are coming closer and closer to the city. I have not been excited about it. I've been curious. I have been wanting to know what's going to happen. I've been wanting to see it. But I haven't been excited because I know a lot of it's just going to be brutal and painful and terrible. Now, that sort of holds true here. Um, the chapter 30, Delaying the Enemy... Um, we start off with, uh, Sari coming and taking care of, um, Sunia and Akron. And it's pretty great, actually. Like, she doesn't realize that Sari's an official thief yet. She doesn't realize that he's, like, a leader in, of any kind. So the surprise when she sees him and how self-assured he is and the fear that he sort of wields, like, the guy who sees him... Um, come up out of his stable from obviously a secret passage goes really pale and Sari all he has to say is just like you never saw this and the guy's like nope I sure didn't I really really liked this moment 
Uh, and I like the fact that Sari, like, his feelings about Sunia have changed. That he looks at her and he still worries about her and he cares about her, but it's just different. That's what happens. You know, it really does. Um, all of this I really enjoy and we'll come back to them. But then we go to the scene um, with the uh, magicians who are trying to hold off the Ichani. Um, Kariko rolls up out and, and he doesn't realize that he's going to be ambushed. Now here's, here's my exact fear. This is part of why I'm not excited about it. There's like 20, 20 of them. I think they said 20, like it's a, it's another large group. Like the ones that were at the fort magicians waiting to ambush Kariko and his like four or so. I think I don't even remember, but it doesn't go well. Like, that's putting it mildly. They slow them down because Rothen thinks things through here. But the futility of it is just really, really hard to read because you know these guys are all going to die. You know that they're going to try their best. You know that they want to do their best, that they care, that they are willing to die. You know that they're going into this knowing in a lot of ways that it's just going to be a measure to buy time and not necessarily any more than that. However, almost all of them wind up dead. And Rothen, he's left alive. And I'm not totally clear what's going on with him because the uh, bloodstone that the, the blood gem that Kariko makes from his blood. Um, does he wear that ring? I guess he does. He must put, so he's going to be able to see what's going on in Rothen's mind and hear what's going on. So he's using him as a spy. I don't remember if Rothen is aware what that stone does. I don't think so because I'm pretty sure that by the time, um, by the time Lorlin reveals that he was given that ring and everything, Rothen isn't in the inner circle that finds out about it, if I'm not mistaken. And he's also like been sent away to spy, I think, by then. So I'm not entirely sure. I'm going to reread this little section here because um, this, yeah, this whole thing is just, it's brutal. You know, I um, they get taken out one by one. Everybody who's like striking at the Ichani is doing so from hiding and then trying to like rush to another hiding place because they recognize that they're not going to be able to stand up in one-to-one -one combat. Um, and so they're like having to cower and hide, which is like them taking advantage. That's the best they can do, honestly, with the power that they have. But it's so embarrassing in a way, you know, just kind of humiliating that there's like this differential that is so high and intense that people that I had been reading as incredibly dignified and powerful are suddenly reduced to this. In a way, it's kind of nice because it's like, you know, but also it's Rothen and I don't want that for Rothen at all. Um, so they they decide because the only two people left apparently are him and Yikmo. And Yikmo is like, I don't really know. Like, I'm pretty sure that we are the only two. Like, they, we can hope that others are hiding, but based on the way that they have talked about it, all of them are claiming that they've killed four and five. That means that practically everybody is gone. Um, so they decide that they are going to um, hit the carts and take out the wheels so that they can't transport as much stuff. And also it uh, frees one of the horses, which that's a pretty big loss, losing a horse. And also, um, I think they kill a couple of slaves or the slaves were killed by the magicians afterwards to like repair their strength. But I'm not totally positive how that worked. But Rothen does this with Yikmo um, and they want to run and hide as soon as they have made that strike. But they don't have time. The um the Achani turn and like zero in on them right away, hit them back, 
And Rothen winds up with a broken arm and he's so drained of power that he can't heal himself. And it's actually really awful because later on he wakes up after like passing out and he has healed himself in his sleep incorrectly. So his arm has started to set ahead of the, you know, normal healing time, which would ordinarily be really helpful. But it's like set so incorrectly that he's going to have to find a healer to re-break it and reset it, which is the worst possible thing. <laughs> like, I hate that so, so much. I feel so bad for him. Um, but before he winds up finding out about his arm setting incorrectly, we have Kiriko, who is talking to Rothen. He's got him like by the neck. Um, and he says, what is your greatest fear? And Sania's face is, pops up in Rothen's mind. And Rothen thinks that he's going to be able to resist this guy. He doesn't realize that you can be forcefully red like this, I don't think. Because he hasn't run into this. And him and Lorlin haven't been, like, talking very much about what's been going on. Lorlin knows that this can happen because of his dealings with Akarin. But Lorlin has never gotten a chance to share any of that with Rothen, because he's been spied on by Akron with that ring the whole time. So there's all this information that I keep thinking, like, he has to know this. And then I'm like, why does he have to know this? And they've never talked about this. So I feel really bad because Rothen is just fucking behind the times and doesn't know what he's up against in many ways. Um, so who is this then? Ah, someone you taught magic to. Someone you care for. But she's gone. Sent away by the guild. Where? Sachaka. Ah, so that's who she is. Akarin's companion. Such a naughty girl breaking the rules. Rothen tried to still his mind, to think of nothing, but Kariko began sending tantalizing images of Akarin into Rothen's mind. He saw a younger Akarin in clothes like those of the slaves in the carts, cowering before another Sachakan. He was a slave. Kariko told him, your noble high lord was once a pathetic, groveling slave who served my brother. Rothen felt a pang of sympathy and regret as he realized that Akarin had told the truth. The last of the anger he had felt towards Sunia's corruptor melted away. He felt a wistful pride. She had made the right decision. A hard decision, but the right one. He wished he could tell her so, but knew he would never get the chance. At least I did everything I could, he thought, and she is far from all this trouble now that the Achani have left Shachaka. Far from trouble? I have allies there still, Kariko sent. They will find her and bring her to me. When I have her, I will make her suffer. And you, you will be alive to see it, slave killer. Yes, I see no harm in that. You are weak, and your body is broken, so you will not reach your city in time to help your guild. And this is when Kariko makes the blood gem. Um, yeah, the tip slowly began to glow and melt until the globule had formed. This fell from the tip of the shard into Kariko's palm. Um, his mind was linked to the glass now, to anyone who touched it. Uh, and... Yeah, Kariko walks away and he's apparently going to like hold on to this somehow, make it into a little bauble so that he can keep an eye on Rothen. And I am just, I hate it. I hate Rothen being a weapon, you know? And honestly, it, it's a smart move that Rothen is able to. That, that Rothen is in the position, and by smart move, I mean the writing is smart here, because you can feel Canavan doesn't want to kill Rothen, right? Like, she, I, I get that from the way that she writes him, is that she has, like, this affection for him, I feel like, as a writer, and she doesn't want to do away with him. So she put him in a position where there is a plausible reason for this man to keep Rothen alive. Now, is it a little bit contrived? Okay, yes, it is. But I really don't have much of a problem with it because having any sort of spy and link 
to, you know, if if Rothen does catch up, if there, there's anything, like, I feel like that's a smart, but how, how, the fact that he's doing it with somebody that he knows, like, or he thinks he knows, couldn't possibly reach the guild in time, makes me wonder what he even hopes to find out, you know? I guess he just wants to use it to torture Rothen later by, by um, tormenting Sania and making Rothen see it. But it's just such a weird, like, it's, it's, what's the word I want? It's the writer leaning on the cruelty of a character in order to explain why he would go that extra step in keeping someone alive that otherwise should not be. And that's fair. There are people out there that I believe are that kind of cruel. And I think this guy qualifies. I mean, we know that this is something that has been done before. Akron has talked about it. But um, yeah, I just can't like this whole thing. I just feel so simultaneously relieved that Rothen is still alive. And also like, well, OK, then um, it's a combo. You know, I'm I'm not mad at it, but I'm also like aware of what's happening. Um, oh, Ashley's here. The guild knows that Akron can do that from that one murderer years back, but Rothen doesn't know Akron can do that from black magic. Okay. Right, right, right. Thank you. Also, hey, Natasha. Hi, Ashley. Um, so, yeah, then we go back to Sunia and Sari, and it's pretty great. Like, uh, she just, you know, finally figures out that he's kind of a big deal. They're all eating, and they're in, like, pretty... They're into cons rooms, I think, at this point when they're eating. And so it's like pretty uh, luxurious. And they're having a sort of good time seeing each other again and getting rested and fed when her thoughts are interrupted by seeing Rothen die. So she thinks. I'm not totally sure what she saw in her mind that makes her think that Rothen's dead. Um if she was seeing from his point of view when he got like picked up by the Achani, um, because one would th- like my, my question is they're able to send pictures of the battle to each other. When the Achani picks him up and starts to read his mind against his will, is that itself visible through sending? Can they tell that the Achani picked him up and read his mind is that is the experience of having his mind read sendable that's my question um do they know that that just happened because i feel like if they don't know that that just happened that's a big fucking problem if they do know that that just happened they might have more of an inkling that he's not dead um so i'm curious about that so um Sari felt his heart twist with concern and saw the same emotion on Akarin's face. The magician pushed the belt to one side and slipped out of his chair to kneel beside her. He drew her against him and held her tightly. Um, so I like this, him observing the way that Akarin and Sunia interact together and the fact that Akarin, like, is displaying a sort of tenderness with Sunia that he has never, that Sari has never seen before. Um, it's just... You know, it's fun to see a character getting another glimpse of a a piece of a character that we all as readers know is there and them finally like catching up to the fact that this is who that person is. Um, So, yeah, I just really liked this. And he's kind of wondering to himself, he's like, I think they're together, actually. But then... Later on, Akron's saying, telling her to get in bed, and she says, I can't sleep. And he says, well, then lay there and warm the bed up for me. And Sari's like, oh, all right, then. I guess that settles that. Um, uh, Ashley's saying, I'm, I don't think so. I'm pretty sure Sunia just thinks Rothen's dead because she saw Rothen earlier. And the Achani say that all the guild magicians are dead. Clearly, she doesn't know that if there's no body, the character's never dead. Okay, so she's just... um. Because she saw Rothen earlier and the Achani say that all the guild magicians are dead. Aha. Got you. Okay. Got you. Um, there's a moment here because 
th- those two go off to bed. And Takan says to Sari, I hope this does not upset you. And Sari's like, them? No. And Takan replies, I thought not, since you are now occupied with another woman. Sari felt his blood turn cold. He glanced at Gaul, who was frowning. How did you know about that? I heard it from one of my guards. Takan glanced from Sari to Gaul. This was meant to be a secret then? Yes, it is not always safe being friends with a thief. The servant looked genuinely concerned. They did not know her name. A young man like yourself would be expected to have a woman. Or many women. Sari managed a grim smile. Perhaps you're right. I'll have to look into these rumors. Good night, then. Takan nodded. Good night, thief. (sighs) You guys... I'm going to jump ahead here for a minute to the end of this uh, last chapter that I covered here. Savara's fucking playing him, right? Like, that gem, obviously, it feels like, that she gives him in the guise of it being like a dragonfly pendant is a blood gem so that she can hear his thoughts, right? I feel like... Does he, like, he sees that being created, but he doesn't seem to think this is what this could be. I'm a little bit, I feel like that's kind of out of character. Sari is so cautious and he watched them making the blood gems just earlier that day. And he, and she specifically says, keep it close to the skin. And he doesn't think about what that means. Like, or Does he? No, he doesn't because he has like a a feeling of guilt as she gives him this gift because he's not being totally honest with her because he has to keep secrets from her. So he feels guilty about not being honest, which means in my mind that he is not at all really aware of, of what this thing is that she just gave him. And that just does not feel like Sari to me. He just watched people create these things in front of him and describe to him how they are made. And he knows that this woman is a magician herself. And he also thinks that he's not entirely sure that he can trust her. He wants to, but he doesn't tell her anything because he knows enough to not trust her that far. And yet this doesn't even enter his mind. He was there seeing them make these I don't understand this. Like, the only thing I could think is that he is aware and it's just covered in that, like, it that's hidden from us that he is aware in, at the end of that chapter. But considering that we're in his mind from his point of view when he receives that as a gift, if it turns out later that he knew and he doesn't let the reader know that he was aware, I'm going to call bullshit. Because you can't just start doing that out of nowhere as a writer. You can't have a third person POV that has previously let the reader in on everything that they are thinking and feeling suddenly be able to like pull back on that and let them let that character hide things from the reader and only share what they want to share. You know, like this, if you want that to be how things work, You need to establish that early on, that this is an unreliable narrator. And if you don't do that, suddenly pulling that out doesn't make any sense. So I'm not a huge fan of the direction that this is going. And I'm worried that like, that Sari is going, it's going to be like, oh, well, he let his feelings for this woman cloud his judgment and now their plans are foiled because people see and hear and whatever at the very least she gives it to him after they create their plan for how they're going to source magic to Sunia and Akarin so you know she was she doesn't get to like see that firsthand but if he if she's reading his mind the details of that plan are in his head and he'll be thinking about it. So she'll still finally find out in the end. So I'm just really kind of mixed up about how this could be and why the author would let us know that he saw these blood gems being made and watched the whole process and then doesn't 
connect the dots that that's what he's been given. Like you would think that the author had specifically had him witness the creation of them in order to explain that he knows what it is later. But either option doesn't work. It's either he watched them make these and doesn't put two and two together, which I don't think works for his character. It's he's too smart for that. Or he does know what it means and puts two and two together, but the reader doesn't hear about it, which also doesn't work. So right now I'm not thrilled with this turn of events. Um, and I feel like the reason that to like, you know, he says something about how my guard heard that you were involved with this woman. I feel like, um, that has to be Savara doing something. I don't know if she's like spilling the beans to other people or what, but I feel like there is some significance to the fact that this is out in a, like that this info is out in the world, that she is doing something to, to tell people for some reason. I don't know why she would want people to know unless it's to sort of discredit him. Um, but yeah, I guess we'll see what happens there. So let's go to chapter 31, uh, titled preparations for war. Lorlin, um, is going in and talking with the king about what they're doing with the outer wall um, and repairing the gates and all of this stuff. And Ilarin, who is the king's cousin, um, is asking, why are we fortifying the gates when the outer wall has fallen into disrepair around the guild? The Satrakans only need to send scouts out to circle the city to discover this. The king smiled grimly. We're hoping the Sachakins don't try that. We are expecting the Sachakins to attack us boldly, Balkan told Ilarin. And since these slaves are a source of power to them, I doubt they'll risk sending them out as scouts. Lorlin noted that Balkan did not mention the possibility that the Sachakins had read this weakness from the minds of the warriors at the fault uh, or at the fort or Kalia. Perhaps the king had asked him to keep the true hopelessness of their position from his cousin. Yikes. That's pretty brutal. Um, he asks what happens once they've entered the city. The king asks a captain, have the houses evacuated? And the man says most have left. And the rest of the people? The gate guards report that the number of people leaving the city has increased fourfold. The king looked at the map again and sighed. I wish this map included the slums. Will they be a problem during the battle? So this, it isn't until later when Sania is talking about this, is it with Sari or I think it's at the, in the large um, meeting with all of the thieves that she mentions the evacuation or they mention the evacuation. She's like, are they telling everybody from the slums to leave also? And they're like, Oh, no, he told the houses to leave and everybody in the slums saw the evacuations and realized something was going on and decided to take it upon themselves to also leave, which can we just talk about how idiotic that is? I didn't realize when they say the number of people leaving the city has increased fourfold. I didn't realize that was a passive thing. I didn't realize they were saying, oh, it's increased fourfold, like people are figuring it out. I thought that was because of a direct command to evacuate. And it turns out, no, they're just fucking expecting people to like figure things out. And they're also putting them outside the city where they will be accessible as sources of power. And... Sania is like horrified at this when she when she hears what they're doing because she's like they're treating they're treating the houses as if they are the most valuable sources of power like that the noble families are the ones that are going to have the most magical potential when the noble houses are obviously the minority by far in terms of sheer numbers and she comes from the slums and they're still not willing to face that the slums could be full of, of potential magic users. 
which is burying their heads so far in the sand that it could be what costs them the entire war. It's baffling to me. And until Sunia specifically asked certain questions and pointed it out, it had not even occurred to me that they could be this stupid. It didn't even enter my head that they would handle this all so poorly. It's shocking that they are this fucking incompetent and unwilling to see slum dwellers as potential resources. They're looking at it like the slum dwellers are just, well, all of these commoners. What? She is the strongest magician in the fucking novices, period. And probably one of the strongest out of everybody in the entire guild. And you all are acting like she's this singular anomaly. Y'all, what is wrong with you? It's just so illogical and so foolish and so obvious how can you be this stupid? Like, honestly, things like this make me low-key want the guild to lose because they are so bad at managing people and they're so classist and they're so callous about it all that I can't help but be like, I kind of just want you all to get your asses handed to you because you're not. We're looking out for people. You're not helping people stay alive, the average person. You're just protecting your friends as usual. And there's no excuse anymore. Maybe you all had not considered slum dwellers as potential, but now you've got somebody amongst your ranks who is one of the, the most powerful. There's no fucking reason to be this goddamned obtuse about it. I just, so yeah, I, I have to admit that like this revelation really threw me for the kind of loop that makes me like almost do a complete about face on where I stand regarding everything in this story. And as much as like the Achani are obviously evil with like holding slaves and killing them and raping them and all of the various things that they do, there is a a, a sort of... There's an argument to be made and, you know, it's something that comes up a lot that civil, civilized cruelty ends in the same way. It's not as direct, but one could argue that it not being direct is an indicator of, of cowardice and of wanting to lie and pretend that you aren't doing what you're doing to people. So while the Achani are like monsters that are exploiting the weak and the poor and the desperate, one could say that's what's happening anyway in Kirelia. And it's simply being veneered so that it doesn't look so uh, obvious, so brutal and so violent. But just because it's indirect does not mean that it's really less violent. Um, I just... Yeah. So guys, I, I'm, I'm having feelings. I am irritated. I don't really know like where I stand on a lot now. And I hope that if Akron and Sunia get in there, that they are able to like do something to slap these idiots in the face and wake them the fuck up. Because I thought better of Lorlin at the very least expected Lorlin of all people to put together that the slums especially need to be dealt with. And Lorlin, this fucking guy, is just not, like, it's so disappointing, you guys. I'm just, I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed. That's not true. I'm also angry. I'm angry, too. Um, but, yeah, so I'm just, I'm feeling a way about it. And, and I reread that section where Sunia is talking to them about this a couple times because I really thought I misunderstood. I was like, they can't, they can't be this stupid. They can't. That's no. Yep. Turns out they can. Um, and top it off, Saren hasn't figured out how to use black magic. So 
reading from these books apparently isn't enough. You need somebody to like show you viscerally with your magic how to do it. So I was hoping that even though I knew it wasn't really going to get them the kind of weapon and, and backup that they needed, I was hoping that there would at least be somebody who could like start everyone down the road of learning this stuff. But it turns out, no, Saren is just, I don't think he's going to be able to crack this code. And they decide that they're going to call Akron back. But when they call, he doesn't answer because he can't let them know that he's in the city. Um, so, okay, we have a little moment with Tyend and Daniel. And I like this because I was so worried when Tyend shows up, I really was like, Why, what are you doing, dude? Because this is going to be a real problem for Daniel. But it turns out everybody is so fucking distracted that it's likely not even going to register on anybody's radar for a little while. And Daniel really wants Tyen to leave. He's like, listen, I'm way too worried about you. And you have latent magical talent that is not developed, which means that you can't defend yourself and you are a primo target for these Achani who are going to be looking for people exactly like you to drain of power. And Tyen is like, if they get to the point where they can find me and drain me of power, it's over anyway. And I'm not fucking leaving. Like you can just, you can just put that right out of your head. And Daniel's like, kind of, he, he's in that position that I think all of us have been in where he's trying to tell somebody to do something because he knows it's for their good and that it's the smart thing to do, but secretly is hoping that that person will ignore him and uh, go ahead and stick around. And that is exactly what happens. Tand is doing what he secretly kind of wants him to do, even though he is worried and, and you know, knows it's a little selfish, I think. Um, but I'm really glad that Tyend is here. And I'm really hoping that something happens by the end of this to make everybody leave him the fuck alone about being a lad at all. Um, but, you know, that's probably just wishful thinking. So, um, let's see, I'm going up through the, uh, the section where they are doing the meeting with all of the um, different thieves. Um, Ravi, oh, Farron, that's right. Uh, Sania pretends to, like, come up at Farron and threaten him for selling her to the, uh, magicians. And it's a pretty good scene. I don't blame Farron at all. He did what he needed to do to make sure that the place didn't get blown up. And maybe he made money off of it. But you know what? There comes a point where you have to cut your losses and, like, make the best of it. And taking that money is probably the only, like... The only plus out of that whole fucking disaster. Um, and then we have this confrontation between Senfel and Akarin. This was pretty great. Senfel is the uh, the magician who faked his own death and disappeared to work for the uh, for the thieves. And he says something like, you finally found me. And Akron's like, finally, dude, I've known from the second that you faked your death, that you weren't really dead. It was not convincing. And I just left you alone. I knew where you were and what you were doing. And that was fine. Um, and he says, I, why did, why did you leave us in the first place? And Senfin says, I found your rules stifling. Why didn't you do anything? Akron smiled. Now, how would that have made my predecessor look? He didn't even notice you were missing. You were not doing any harm here, so I decided to let you, say, let you stay. When he says, I found your rules stifling, I found that compelling. Does that mean that he knows black magic as well, or just that he's wanting to do what he wants? Um, and Akron adds, plus I was just waiting until I needed you. Senful sobered. The guild had been calling you. It would seem they have need of you. Why don't you answer? Because the guild must not know we are here. Why is that? And they give the entire story, and this is when they begin to develop their plan of action. Guys, this is a really good idea, but it sounds so enormous in like an undertaking that I was like, it would be great if you all had the time to do this, but you don't. But it sort of seems like Things are so dire, and this is literally the only chance that they've got. 
that they're going to make the most out of every spare second they have before the Achani actually reach Kirelia. Because them being slowed down by not having their carts and their horses, that's actually going to be really helpful. So I'm sure they'll be able to find carts and horses pretty quickly from where they are. Like, just go up to the next house and kill everybody inside. But um, I just really, like, I w- this is just, like I said, an enormous undertaking. Oh, I'm sorry. Ashley's over here commenting. and I didn't see any of these. Uh, clearly she doesn't know that if there's no body care. Oh, I read that one. They have zero regard for the slum dwellers just in case we had any doubts. Yeah. And yeah, when, when they, I, when you say like they have zero regard for the slum dwellers, I like in my head immediately put zero regard in the terms of they don't think that they are worth anything like in the traditional classist sense. But zero regard apparently encompasses that they still don't think that they have they could be potential sources of power, which is such a a next level no regard that it just didn't even like register for me that they could be that stupid. Um, it's terrible people fighting slightly more terrible people. Yep. Um, he really gets the worst of both worlds. He's not capable of learning black magic, at least so far, and he loses his position. Oh, Saren, you're right, because he doesn't have his position. Oh. That's such bullshit, man. They need to fucking fix that. I'm mad about it. Um, so this is what they decide to do. Um, they are going to use the thieves to help separate Sachakins from the group because they can't face a whole bunch of them, but they can do one at a time. When they do the one at a time, they're going to be doing that from like the uh, the secret thieves road so that they're hidden. With the rest of the people, like, not being um, evacuated the way they're supposed to, you know, at first, Sunia is just so disgusted and and irritated. But then they start to talk about the fact that, like, all right, the slum dwellers don't trust magicians, but they trust the thieves to a degree. And if they trust the thieves, the thieves can convince them to be... What's the word I want? Sounded? Um, to be scanned? To find out if they have power? And then all they need is a tiny little, like, prick in the skin, and they can collect from everybody who seems to have any talent at all. Which is pretty, like, that's a, a really, really smart idea. And later on, once Sunia has done this, she's, like, humming with such power, again, that Akron has to teach her how to keep it restrained because it's just like leaking right up out of her skin. Um, which I find pretty exciting. Like that's something that as much as I was saying earlier, I often don't look forward to battles like this because Sunia is in a place now where she has this kind of advantage. Now I'm feeling more excited because she's gotten juiced up. So now you're just like, okay, yeah, I want to see this. I want to see where this all goes, what, like, exactly in comparison to an Achani, how much power does she have? Is she, has she gotten past what they've been able to power themselves up on? Or is she at their level? Or has, have they killed so indiscriminately recently that there is absolutely no contest and she's still behind? Because they've all killed like a number of magicians, but most of the magicians that they've killed, they have done that after the magician has drained themselves, defending themselves. So there isn't a ton of power left, hopefully. So it could kind of go either way. Um, So yeah, Senfil says, I will test all of the volunteers. Only those that have potential will see Sunia and Akron, and that will mean only a hundred or so will know they're here. And uh, later on, when we see Sunia and Akarin like, dealing with these people, they're both, they, she has a veil on and he's wearing a mask. So that uh, they're, even if the minds are red, they aren't going to be able to say for sure who those people were behind the masks. Um, there'll be an educated guess. They could probably figure it out or, you know, guess at it. But be- better safe than sorry. Um so now that we know the nature of these Achani, I can see the suggestions I was going to make for fighting them will not work. 
We should keep out of the way as much as possible. Yes, Farron agreed, and warn the dwells to keep out of sight, too. Better still, Ravi said, bring the dwells into the passages. It will be a tight squeeze, and the air might get a bit thin, but magicians' battles don't take long from what I'm told. So how are we going to lure an Achani away from the main group? Zil, Zil asked. I hear Lymek has a good tailor, Sari said, giving the bushy-haired thief a meaningful look. Fancy yourself in robes, the man said in a deep voice. Oh, they'd never believe a magician could be so short, Farron scoffed. Hi, Sari protested. He pointed at Sania. They're short magicians. Sania felt something brush against her arm and looked down to find Akarin's fingers lightly touching her skin. These people are braver than I thought, he sent. They appear to understand how dangerous and powerful the Achani are, yet they are still willing to fight them. Senea smiled and sent him a fleeting image of dwells throwing stones at magicians during the purge, then of the sewer system that had enabled Sari to bring them into the city. Why wouldn't they? They had been fighting and outwitting magicians for years. I really, really liked that moment a lot. Um, so yeah, we have the, uh, the start of chapter 32 where Rothen wakes up. Um, and, you know, remembers that this blood gem was made and that his arm is all fucked up now. And he comes outside. There are bodies of, um, what do you call it? Slaves where the cart had been. And uh, Yikmo is dead. He had hoped that Yikmo had been able to make it, but he did not. Um, and what is it? Oh, yeah, here it is. Yikmo had been respected and admired in the guild. Though he hadn't been strong magically, his sharp mind and ability to teach novices with learning difficulties had gained him high regard of both Balkan and Akarin. Which is why Akarin chose him as Sinia's teacher, Rothen thought. She liked Yikmo, I think. She'll be upset when she hears of his death. Um, as, as with the rest of the guild, he considered communicating the news, but something made him hesitate. The guild must know, from the silence following the battle, that all had perished. The Sachakins could not be sure. Best not tell them anything they don't already know, he thought. Getting to his feet, Rothen turned to the house. He entered cautiously and approached the front room. A gaping hole opened onto the road. The shattered remains of two carts formed two piles in the center of the thoroughfare. So there's a little kid here, a young boy. Um, and... He kind of is just really awkward dealing with a magician trying to bow and be cool and doesn't know what he's doing. Um, and he, like, Rothen asks him if he has any horses or if he can get any. And there's a moment where the where he tells the kid to deal with the bodies uh, to find some men to do that. And the kid asks, well, what do you what do you want us to do with them? Put them in the Kalia Cemetery? And then Rothen suddenly thinks about the graves at the guild, which didn't make much sense to him because there weren't bodies supposedly, but he realizes now that if someone's power is drained as a magician, there will be a body. They don't explode the way that they do. And, you know, and I think that's a really nice little like moment of realization for him because it's not something that I cared about that I kept thinking like, oh, well, that doesn't make any sense. But it's just another one of those like callbacks of like, oh, shit, there's a little tiny mystery solved. If the guild used to use black magic, then yeah, this would be necessary, you know? Um, so I really, I, I like little moments like that where it's not a big deal, but it's just another piece of the puzzle clicking into place. Um, so then we have Sunia and she's like meeting with the different uh, dwells to take their power and this is when she sees Jonna and she hasn't seen her in ages. And it's a really nice little reunion. Um, and it turns that Jonna has a little bit of power. It's a very small amount. There's nothing that, uh, you know, it wouldn't really develop into much. But um, it's a it's fun that she realizes that her magic comes from her mother's side. Um, and they're talking about family and how everything is going. And... I liked this. The problems John are related seemed wonderfully simple and ordinary. Sunia listened, then told her aunt of everything that had happened since their last meeting, including some of her doubts and fears. At the end of the story, Jonna regarded her speculatively. 
"'It's hard to believe that the quiet little child I had to raise "'had grown into such an important person,' she said. "'And you did and you did with this Acheron, the High Lord of the Guild. Um, "'I just feel... I, I like this little... "'Like, I don't care about Jonah, really. "'It's not... And and that's a tricky thing as a writer to like get your readers to really give a shit about these kinds of relationships. And I don't care about Jonah specifically. It's that I have had it impressed on me so effectively how important Jonah is to Sunia that I care on behalf of Sunia, you know. And um, I feel like that's the best way to go if you're trying to write a character that you know it's going to be tough for your readers to really connect with that the best method is to have it be that the reader connects with the emotional bond that your main character has at the very least. Um, so yeah, I just, I really liked this and I think that uh, it's a sweet sort of, it's a little bit of a break before all of the shit hits the fan and a reminder of what Sunia is fighting for here, you know? Um, and also her aunt is like straight up asking her, you're not going to get knocked up, right? Which was also hilarious to me. She's just like, Mitch, please be fucking careful. Like, Jesus Christ. And I was like, you know what? You're right, though. Um, But it's really, I don't know. I found that really funny. Just how in the midst of all of this, mama's going to mama. You know what I'm saying? She's still concerned about this kind of thing, even though right now it's really, you would think, going to be the last thing on someone's mind. Um, so, doo -doo -doo, oh yeah, they have a meal with Sari again. Um, and this is when Akarin teaches Sunia how to keep it contained. And uh, she has this moment, I like this, where she's touching Akron and she feels the fact that he loves her. Like she can feel the, the emotion that's in his head when he looks at her, despite feeling this later on, she has that moment of like, well, the blood gems, maybe if I, cause he says what he says here, and I'm, I'm going to read this to you. Um, with these rings, I'll be able to see, we'll be able to see into each other's minds. This has some disadvantages. Sometimes hearing and knowing exactly how another person regards you can be an unpleasant experience. It can end friendships, turn love to resentment, and destroy self-regard. But it can also deepen understanding. We should not wear these any more than we must. Um, and this is a, a moment of, again, the... Uh, like low key doubt that I don't think is valid at all. And I, I appreciate at least that the author was like, well, maybe he's afraid that he would reveal too much. And then she's like, but I think I'm pretty sure how he feels. And at least she like reassures herself of that. Because if there was another, like if this turned into this big thing, like, well, maybe he doesn't want me to see that he doesn't give a shit. I was just going to be like, Oh, can we not? We all know he loves you. Stop it. But thankfully it doesn't feel like we're going to have that dragged out too much. Um, so they go and they are about to get into bed and there's a package of all of clothing and she's startled to see that they're black magician's robes. Um, and it's just like, well, first of all, we can't wear these because we're, he says we can't wear these. We are not guild magicians. It's a crime. Um, and there will be no mistaking us for ordinary magicians either because these are black. And she then says, well, maybe we're supposed to wear the robes underneath the other clothes, like the, the ordinary clothes, because they gave us like these big baggy regular clothes. Um, and we're supposed to remove these clothes at a specific time. And, She's arguing for it. And then she realizes that the robes are the robes of a graduated magician. And she protests suddenly like, oh, I can't wear these. And Akron's at this point, his mind has changed. And he's like, no, you know what? I think I'm picking this up. We, we should not show these unless our identities have been discovered. But once they have, 
then the Sachakans might think that the guild have, has accepted us back. And if they have accepted us back, then the implications of that will make Kariko pause. And what he what he means is if they think that they've accept if the Sachakans believe the guilds accepted us back, they may be worried that the guilds practicing black magic now and are a lot more powerful than they had anticipated when they came through initially. That they asked me to come back to teach them. And I've kept off the radar enough that they don't know how long I've been back. If we've been accepted back, it could have been, you know, a while back enough to teach everyone and for them all to get super powered up. So I like this. This is a fun like little twist and it's a really smart move on Sari's part. And I'm just a big fan of Sari. I'm just, you know what? I'm here for him except for this weird business with the stone. Um, so yeah, this moment with her, I'm not feeling, but we'll see Savara. I mean, um, so I think that's everything and I'm a little over time. Um, I have Dairy Girls coming next, so if you guys want to hang out with me for that, that'll be fun. Um, and uh, Magical Birth Control sounds so handy, says Ashley. Yes, it do, though. Amen. Uh, it would be so nice to be able to heal yourself from cramps and everything. It'd be so nice to, like, if I, I'm wondering, like, women dealing with the the, um, the healing powers, like, can you just have your period last like an hour and clear your uterus out in like an instant and then be done. Cause that would be amazing. Oh, all of the p potential and possibilities. Um, anyway, so I'm going to wrap, but thank you all so much for listening. Thank you, Ashley, for this commission. And I will be seeing you again soon with a new episode. Toodaloo motherfuckers. <laughs>